mindfulness apps, sleep aids, smart foods, smart bikes, health trackers, aromatherapy, injectables, organic everything. People are spending more on wellness than they ever have before. Wellness is now a $1.5 trillion market worldwide, and it's growing at a clip of 5 to 10% each year. McKinsey research shows that consumers are most interested in six wellness categories, health, fitness, nutrition, appearance, sleep, and mindfulness. New wellness products and services are hitting the market every day. So what might wellness look like in 2030? Let's look into the future. I see there being a lot more offerings that let consumers triage any medical issues and take care of things for the most part by themselves and only bringing in a doctor when that's really absolutely necessary. I also see this concept of devices moving from the doctor's office into the home. The pharmaceutical products of today will become the over-the-counter, easily accessible products of tomorrow. I definitely don't see a world where it's just the at-home solutions and there's no, uh, no gyms and no studio. I, I don't see that at all. I always like to say if Starbucks likes to think it can be a third place, then a gym can very well be a third place. And we'll also see, I think, a next step in terms of the ability to track or to give people ability to, hey, how, how do I know I'm improving? Tracking actually plays a very strong role, not in optimizing everything, but in actually playing a strong motivation and guidance or coaching role. People are reading a lot more labels. We think that will continue. They're looking to reduce sugar, but they are also looking for more sustainable eating. So we now have about 35% of consumers in the UK, the US, and Germany drinking plant-based milk at least some of the time. Half of them started in the last year. So that's quite a sea change, much faster than we usually see in the way we eat and we think it's gonna keep going. So in 2030, I think that there's actually going to be an expansive amount of services that are offered within beauty retailers. You'll have the opportunity to actually get injectable services done. So if you wanna plump up your cheeks or you wanna plump up your lips, you'll be able to get clinical treatments like microdermabrasion that up until now have really been, you know, saved for being done at a dermatologist office or a med spa. You might actually be able to get a tattoo at the same place that you're buying your makeup because it's all about how you wanna express yourself. There's new innovations with sensors going under the mattress that can tell both how much you're moving around at sleep, how much time you spent in the bed. Imagine if your sleep data was connected to your exercise service or your exercise bike or your trainer. And now in, when you hop onto your, your bike, you are getting a class that's designed for someone that's having a poor night's sleep. Or imagine your fridge is starting to make suggestions to you. Don't make coffee. I actually believe that mindfulness and the pursuit of mindfulness will become an essential aspect of how we live our lives. There is a little bit of, in my mind, a risk of the over-commercialization and frankly, being a bit of a gimmick. At least what's happening is people are more aware of this as an offering, as a service. I do think that, you know, technology and wearables will have a big role to play in this. A typical day for somebody who's a professional could look like they may actually start the day with either an offline or an online yoga or meditation class. And again, you know, back through the wearable, at whatever time in the evening, it'll start telling you, listen, you need to now uh, quieten your mind. It's easy to kind of dream those sorts of possibilities. If wellness in 2030 will indeed be more tech-heavy, personalized, and interconnected, what does that mean for companies? What should companies do today to be successful in 2030? It's critical to think about your digital strategy, and we mean that in a really broad sense. So both from a channel perspective, are you well set up to succeed, especially in e-commerce? And then also from a marketing perspective, leveraging the power of social and influencers. Data is going to be the key and having a, a way to tie these different data systems together is probably the, the best secret. Interconnectedness of data, interconnectedness of partnerships, that's gonna be the real opportunity here. 
So by 2030, I really think we're gonna see a completely different store experience. It's about capturing that concept of discovery, either through services or through classes or through just a curated, excited and gamified experience in order to bring that consumer in. So being able to see 3D versions of your face and actually being able to apply different color cosmetic products to it so that then you can just simply hit buy and have all of the products sent to your home. Understand how your value proposition might have changed. If as an example, you're a gym and you realize that in this more diverse routine, people are more creative about how they do cardio. How do I make sure I am seen as one of the solutions of today? We think consumer goods companies need to own the explosion of small in their own categories. A lot of the growth is in smaller niche products. Consumer goods companies have all the expertise they need to excel at those. They don't just don't always like the economics. Keep experimenting with ways to get great at small. You've got to think about the individual as a whole person. I think a lot of offerings are coming at the individuals almost as components, as opposed to thinking of them as a whole human being and thinking about the arc of their day or the arc of their year, and where is all that gonna fit in it. Think about what is truly going to have lasting change.